Welcome to the Axial Podcast. Axial is an early stage investment firm based in San Francisco. We partner with great founders and inventors investing in early stage life science companies often when they are no more than an idea. Axial is fanatical about helping the rare inventor who is compelled to build their own enduring business. Hey, Caddy, how are you? Great to have you on the podcast, and I'm just really excited to talk to you. Uh, it's about your career and research on everything. I think I found you a superstar, so um, how are you? Hi, hi, Chess. Good to, good to talk to you. I'm doing very, very well today. How about you? Um, just kind of a busy Sunday. So this is, I think it's a Monday, so you it's, recorded. Uh, so. It's a Monday, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm up in the north where the um, heat wave has just uh, just arrived, you know, the two two weeks a year when it's here. So I'm, I'm very much under the heat wave at the moment. But other than that, in, very good. In England? Uh, I'm uh, typically located in Estonia at the moment, where my family is. Uh, I think England just had a heat wave, yes. Jeez Louise. Yeah, it was in, in San Francisco, there was like, a, like 100 degrees one day. And it was like so brutal. I had to go work out, and I felt like I didn't. Run, I ran like six miles that day, and it was just brutal. But let's uh, let's talk about you. Um, and uh, I just find you so fascinating. Your whole just your whole personal journey, and then your research. I'm a huge fan of your research in the Alpha Leads lab, Alpha Leads Lab at Oxford. And then like just really excited to see what you do. Um, is Alpha Lee in Cambridge? He's not Oxford. Or exactly. He's, uh, he's, he's Cambridge. He's Cambridge. He's, uh, actually, he did his PhD, I believe, in Oxford. Yeah. But now, as uh, you know, I've been working okay. with him. Okay. Cool. This is, I'm so glad we have video on because I just saw your body language. I saw your response. <laughs> I just yeah. saw it. I just saw it. I just saw, oh, I, I said something wrong. Uh, but uh, maybe to start off, maybe we can talk about, you know, how you got involved in science, how you got excited as a kid, and, and then we can go from there. Sounds sounds good to me, and thanks uh, thanks once again for inviting me here. It's really really great you're you're doing this series. Okay, so okay, yeah. so Caddy, so how, how did you? So what's the most important question I like asking people? Is how, what, what got you excited about science? When was that moment, or maybe moments? Interesting. I'm um, I'm not sure. I can actually point back to one one moment. I think I I probably was one of those kids who was just always kind of excited about science and, and technical subjects in the world world around me and then just a curious uh curious kid so i'm not sure i can point down to one one moment i think my interest just grew um grew over uh over time um i come from from a family where both of my parents are uh, trained as medical doctors so maybe that to some degree also influenced mm -hmm. the fact that I kind of you know science was always always around me um but uh and w when i went to school i noticed myself being quite good at um at math and uh, and technical subjects and then when you know other scientific subjects like chemistry and physics came uh, came around i kind of felt like there was just another 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 application of mathematics and i think that's how i got mm. interested in um in this um yeah i don't know if i have anything uh else very very original to to say here but that's yeah uh, did you have any do you have any books playing around so like my mom's an anthropologist and so I would have books laying around as a kid and I would just read the books. Do you, mm -hmm. you have certain things like that were like in the house that just like, you know, your parents just had as like a throwaway, but then you just got roped into it somehow. Um, or maybe, maybe just you're a genius. And so it just, you know, Caddy's a genius and your parents knew it. So okay, let, let Caddy do her thing. And <laughs> do you have any hobbies as a kid, like collecting things or, you know, do we, you know, any, maybe that, that too? uh interesting i think we did have lots of uh books around and they probably felt like such a natural thing to have that i i didn't even pay any any attention to the to the fact that i i had them around but you know if you're even thinking about back like you know the the tv that people have on as parents when you're when you're growing up i do remember there were often times like trivias or quizzes and uh on them on uh, on tv right so we wouldn't have like you know completely uh like probably we wouldn't have that many kind of you know reality shows or or films on but like kind of you know educational uh, background on so i think that's exactly probably why i can't point back to one one moment but i think it was just yeah. always around me where wherever i wherever i was and always you know access to information through my parents that whenever i would ask ask a question there they were they were there they were happy to answer it and um and so on, yeah. So uh, kind of, yeah. Again, nothing, nothing very like 
specific oh. to point that, but I think the full environment that I was uh, I was in was just kind of you know geared geared up for doing science on some level. Yeah. Cool. I think uh, in America at least, I'm going to talk to your parents. Maybe your parents will write a book, a parenting book, and it'll be a bestseller in America. Um, and, and your parents write some book about how to raise a kid, and like every every parent in America will will buy it. But okay, so let's take a segue into the reality TV show. Um, so you were on a reality TV show. Uh, you were on Estonia's most talented, or Estonia's Got Talent. Um, yeah, so how, how did you? Can, can you? Uh, I think your 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 talent was your uh, arithmetic machine, or is it the term? Um, how did you get? How did you? How did you get on the show? Uh, and, 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 and how did you realize you're so good at multiplying numbers? <laughs> yeah, I think actually here, here probably what I need to thank is the um, Estonian educational uh, system on, uh, on some level, but you know, how, how I ended up at the, at the show that's I think kind of a longer story in the, uh, in the sense that um, when, when you go to school, Estonia is kind of organizing a lot of, I guess, competitions uh, for various different subjects. Some of them are in math, uh, but you also have competitions in, say, linguistics, where, you know, people yeah. across the country are coming together and are, are solving um, exercises. And most recently, you know, almost any humanities subject like uh, philosophy and history as well. It kind of started with more scientific subjects. And then, for instance, in, in math and in this um, mental arithmetics that I was doing, like, you know, across the country, mo I don't know, half of the kids maybe would uh, would be taken to a computer class because back then kids didn't have computers at home, right? And you'd go there and you, you know, work with this program and try to do the math. And I think the first time when I when I did it, and you know, I'm getting the ranking, uh, rankings, and the rankings are showing to me like you're you're number three in your country, and I was like, oh wait, I'm just doing it for the first time in my life, and then that's good. Maybe I should put more uh, more effort into practicing this, and that was when I was like maybe eight or nine when it first started happening, and then um, I participated at the competitions every year and so on, and then uh, interestingly, when the TV show Stern has Got Talent um, got started, they had you know lots of interest from across the board singers and dancers and so on uh, on coming there but the organizers had kind of you know heard of this mental arithmetic uh, competitions that kids were kids were doing and they got in touch with the organizers and were asking like is there is there anyone whom you would recommend who would come to the show to like spice it up a little bit compared to what we have at the moment and um yeah somehow the orga organizer actually he first recommended my brother's name who was really good at this as well but my brother was like no i'm not gonna go into the tv like some reality show not for me probably exactly for the fact that they were never playing for us at home right he was like where is this reality show <laughs> um but i was like well if you don't want to go i can go instead of you <laughs> right and uh, yeah i went first to the preliminary round and then they then the final afterwards and it worked out very very nice and i was just kind of um amazed that people were um interested in a skill like this because you could also send your votes for you know singing and uh, and everything else that there was as part of this uh the show and uh what i found even more interesting perhaps was the fact that the tv show itself took place on the 30th of december so i was doing my math skills and then everyone had a chance to call in and vote for whomever they they liked and they ended up winning it and getting getting the prize just has got talent it was the first uh uh first essentially series or first year when they were doing that tv show all uh, all together so the inaugural one and then about five days later uh when uh, the student president was giving a speech like he actually pointed back to this example when he was saying estonians have always been a nation who has loved who have loved education and that was for instance amplified or exemplified when uh just you know five days ago the public voted someone was who was using their brain as the you know top talent of the of the country so <laughs> it was just really really great to see that all the all the country actually liked it and appreciated it so yeah. okay you, you have groupie okay cool you have like probably have super fans of you uh so like i don't want to push you on the spot we'll take, we'll, we'll take 978 times 100. you know that okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> can you do that? Hundred, yeah. So just add two zeros. And that's <laughs> exactly. I don't want to. I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to add. I want to. I don't want to. I don't want to give you some complicated number that you have to like. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe you lost your edge, but uh, you know, maybe not. Uh, but uh, maybe. Okay, we've established that, Caddy, you, you're 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 special, and you know, in a good way, and you you you're, you're really talented. <laughs> This is my opinion. My opinion, you know, you're a very special person and very I, I talented. Think every, everyone is special, just in their own own way. But I guess that's a longer discussion. But that's that's a fact. Everyone is. <laughs> it's okay. You 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 have this kind of interest in mathematics and science, and maybe you can talk more about your journey to Cambridge and you and how you got to the Lee Lab and how you really got. How did you start doing work in computational chemistry in particular? Given you have a skill set, you can do anything. 
in my opinion. So how did you get involved in Cambridge? How did you get involved in research? And you know, what was your journey towards uh, kind of where, you, where you're now, at least from a scientific perspective? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, very, very good questions. And I actually didn't find this choices um, easy at all. Um, I think, uh, you know, when, when, when I still ba uh, think back to the days when I was at high school, I was considering the uh, professional sports as a potential career as well. And um, actually, when I was on that same Estonia Scott uh, talent show, I think one of the aspects that, that maybe even helped me to to win, but or, or you know, somehow made my strong even case was exactly the fact that I was uh, in parallel a professional uh, sports uh, person as well. And then you have this human calculator whom everyone was expecting to be an old man <laughs> turning onto the stage. But then you have this like 15 year old girl who was actually. Two <laughs> okay, okay, well, okay, we're going to link the YouTube video. When I saw the YouTube video, it was it blew my mind. So we're going to link it. And so you can click on the link and watch Caddy multiply numbers. It's it's incredible. <laughs> Maybe, but I mean, I did put the organizer help as well by saying that there was a human calculator coming in, and then there wasn't a gray or uh, gray-haired old man. No, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little girl who shows up. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, you know, so going back to your, your question, like sports was always a very big part of my my life, and I was very certain I will just go to US and play in probably you know, in an Ivy League college where uh, sports would help me to to get in and uh, and do this. Um, uh, but then I think I kind of started asking myself the the question that will will that essentially postpone the time when I need to make a choice if I want to you know invest more time into science and technology and math and you know my essentially um, schoolwork versus investing that time in in sports that you know it's really great because I could do these things in parallel you can't do that well in uh, that so well in parallel in any in the universities in the UK. Uh, and I told myself, like, you know, it's really attractive at this moment, but, you know, four years down the line, I will again be facing the same choice. Like, do I want to go more towards professional sports or do I want to go more towards science? And, you know, let's just make this choice slightly, slightly earlier. And that's why I decided to go to um, Cambridge in, uh, instead. But like a big part of me, I feel, especially during uh, first year of my university studies was kind of uh, regretting this a little bit because UK is asking you to specialize much earlier so this fact combined with the fact that i couldn't play tennis the, as much as i could have in the in the us i think the first uh, first year in the uk university was actually mentally quite um quite hard for me but then it forced me to maybe make choices more than i would have in the um in the us uh, and then yeah at the at the end of my first year i was um i was thinking do i want to do chemistry do i want to do physics and it was uh, you know you, you had some some freedom but you kind of had to choose what you're specializing in uh, and then I heard about this possibility to study chemical engineering, which to me sounded like a combination of chemistry, physics and math. And, uh, and I thought, I'll, I'll go with, uh, with this. In reality, afterwards, I found out that chemical engineers learn surprisingly little about chemistry. For them, it's literally like A plus B reacting and producing C and D with a reaction constant of K1 and K2. But what exactly A and B are, we were playing, uh, paying uh, surprisingly little uh, little attention to. But it was quite heavy on, um, on mass. So I think in terms of the physical sciences training that I, I got through that, that, uh, that wasn't, wasn't bad. And then during my undergrad, I actually really enjoyed the design projects that we did at the end of the course. We were, um, my group was designing an ammonia plant. And uh, again, like, you know, a lot of math and science is coming, coming together. And I, and I thought I could even, you know, maybe do this for, for career, like go, go and design chemical, chemical plants that could be quite, mm, quite, uh, quite good and interesting. And then I think that was kind of another um, point in my life where I needed to make a hard, hard choice and just didn't know how to, how to make it. Um, and probably a few, a few factors that were contributing was uh, one, um, I think uh, my family was actually advising that, you know, if you've already gone to university and are on this, uh, this path, why don't you just go out and do that PhD as well? And I think what really, really helped was the fact that during one of my summer internships, I had been uh, working with a uh, person, uh, Professor uh, Thomas Knowles now, back then he wasn't a professor, but uh, who, who, who I just thought was a really, really great person to work with, who, whom I enjoyed working with, whose research I liked, and who I felt was really you know, supporting me as a person person as well. So I think that this kind of, you know, two aspects together, that I actually had a good environment where to, where to go to, like Thomas's group, and my um, parents encouraging this direction of doing a PhD were, were the ones that kind of shifted me to watch this uh, academic um, path. Otherwise, I probably would have just, you know, gone and work, worked in some of the major kind of, you know, chemical engineering uh, companies, maybe even oil companies uh, for uh, for doing this work. But uh, this, uh, you know, little, uh, little little things came, came together that actually affected that outcome. Hmm. 
Cool. I think, yeah, I think probably the tennis decision was really hard. So I have friends who are like growing up as kids, they're really good at golf or something. And then they got the, they got the college and they kind of gave it up. And it's like, it leaves a major hole in your life. But in these transition periods you're describing, you're alluding to your family, help you make the decision. What, what kind of, the, you know, when you're in those transition periods, like everyone is in a career, you know, how do you, what's your framework to think about how to make a choice? Is it, is it based on, like the people you work with, it's probably a combination of things too. Is it based on what you're really good at? Is it based on what you want to learn? Like kind of what's your high level framework to, you know, make a good decision in a transition period? I think a lot of, especially a lot of scientists have that issue. Um, yeah. Oh, you think uh, scientists predominantly, uh, no, no other disciplines. That's the well, I think, I think every, the whole world, the whole world, I think scientists, yeah. if people are scientists have a huge issue of like, they get the PhD, then what? That's a, that's a, one of the hardest transitions ever. Because like you're trained at you like you you're like essentially an Olympian scientifically in a certain field, and then the you're probably not going to become a professor. It's really so interesting. Then, yeah, I actually the, I actually didn't find the choices uh, at that level uh, anymore as uh, as hard. I felt like you know the younger I was, the the worse you know the less experience I had with making choices, and probably the choices were also kind of you know it could have taken me in more different paths. Like now we are kind of you know to some degree it's defined where where you are and sure you know you can kind of pivot pivot to different areas as well but i felt the, the decisions i had to make at the age of 15 16 on some level were were somehow mm -hmm. harder because they could have taken me somewhere com completely uh different i think and, i think uh, when you're i think when i think when you're a phd you have sunk cost where like you mm -hmm. spent like six years spending learning about chromatin and then you get, then you're done do you, do you keep on doing that or do you get a job somewhere and it's just like really rough, actually. It's like a really rough transition um, because you, you, you you're, it's kind of like, it's like someone like playing, being a professional tennis player. I'm just a professional yeah, pro well, tennis I mean, studier. I kind of don't don't have at this uh, at this moment anymore, right? So they're kind of you know more confined in space, right? The choices that I have. Yeah, it's and it's like a it's, it's a bummer up. when you when you realize you studied some really esoteric topic that mm -hmm. maybe doesn't have a value. Um, or it doesn't really have, or maybe it's just, yeah, it just it's not nice to do something else. It's, I think it's my own experience and see other people. It's pretty, it's pretty hard. And so it seems like you made, it seems you made a series of good decisions. Yeah, <laughs> That's well, fascinating. Yeah, coming, coming back to the question of making, uh, making choices, I think there, I mean, you, you can't spend all the time thinking about what you're going to do, but I think that there is value in kind of being a little bit strategic about it so kind of you know a year year before if not knowing what you want to do at least starting to actively think about this uh this question and trying to kind of you know interact with and reach out to people whom you think can help you in uh, in that process is uh, i think quite uh, uh quite important and uh and you know when when it actually comes to making the the choice i think the the people whom you would have on uh, either side you know if you make choice by a choice b the people who would be with you as part of the of the choice is kind of a very very important factor as well in the in the decision making together with how much you would like it and you would enjoy it but oftentimes they're kind of linked right you know you may enjoy something but if you don't like the people around you then you probably don't like what you're doing either right and vice, vice versa even if they are not maybe if it's not your top choice if it's not if it's your bottom choice it's a different story but if it's your you know top three choices then already the environment is the one that is making a huge um huge difference right Totally agree. Good, um, my thing. I think but that, none of the choices I've had to make have been as, uh, as hard as the one to, you know, give up in professional tennis at the age of 15, uh, 15, 16. So every time I can point back to this saying, I was able to make that choice. I can make every other one as well. <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> Kenny could have been, uh, oh, it is, it is a hard decision, though. I, I like, I mean, you said, how long were you playing tennis? How, how old were you when you started playing tennis? Like five years old or? I think mm -hmm. I started when I was like, uh, no, uh, six or seven, something like se seven probably oh. was when, uh, when I started. But, you know, we invest a lot of time into uh, into oh. this. And the, the people whom I was playing together with, like, you know, there are some of them who are top 10 ranked people in the world uh, at this moment, right? And, you know, people who are oh. in the finals, semifinals, I've, uh, I've played against uh, many, uh, many of them during my junior uh, junior days. So uh, essentially, you know, you, you invest a lot of time into this and give up on a lot of other things. And, uh, in life, so maybe that's what making you know. You mentioned some cost before, so maybe there was even an element of uh, of this in, uh, in that. Oh man, and so I'm convinced exactly. I'm convinced. What are you tell me you're a superstar caddy, so I think you're going to become a top ten biotech person or something. The equivalent. You're going to become the equivalent 
top 10 tennis, but in biotech, we're, it's going to be, it's going to be so, it's going to be so exciting. Um, uh, and so maybe to make a transition toward, um, you know, I think a really good point you made, you know, do things, do th- do things you like the people around too. You want to be, you don't like the people you work with. And so if you don't like them, do something else. And so, uh, with this broad skill set you have, how did you pick chemistry? Was it just a passion you've always had? And you enter Cambridge, say, I want to do something in chemistry and physics. And then kind of alluded to that through kind of just studying, you know, I, you know, some, I meet people who like learn, you know, have skill sets to do machine learning, AI type of work, and they get pulled into a bunch of different directions. And so I have a lot of respect for you to say, hey, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to be the best computational chemist in the world. What was the kind of the, how did you, was it just based on the people or was it based on maybe something, maybe was it based on a problem you want to solve or is there, is there something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and interestingly, I don't know if I if I should necessarily define myself as uh, as a chemist because uh, I think mm-hmm. like chemistry is certainly one of the one of the, like the keywords that has been there at every stage in my career. As I said, my undergrad was in chemical engineering, my PhD was in biophysical chemistry. The kind of uh, postdoc work now with Alpha has been more on computational chemistry, so it has always been there, but has never been the only uh, only thing. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I I think probably it is defined by what you ultimately want to want to do what interests and excites you and I feel in my case this has been very much essentially um, helping to helping to advance healthcare and that is somewhere on the interface between chemistry and uh, and biology and again you know with my parents being medics they had access to essentially you know patients and and practical uh, practical medicine but they were never that much and they you know, technology R and D side of uh, of this, and I think uh, that's essentially what uh, what excited excited me. Like, you know, I wouldn't be doing exactly the same stuff as them, but you know, it's still in the area of things that I'm um, I'm interested. And I think yeah, chemistry is probably exactly you know some people define it in a way that chemistry is everything that involves uh, involves molecules. And I was kind of thinking about biology as well during my undergrad, but I just felt I wasn't I wasn't made for it in the sense that I had so much like learning and details that I was unable to grasp and uh, and I kind of decided to go more through the route of specializing my undergraduate education in physics, chemistry, engineering, and then uh, learning learning the biology aside, which I sometimes, you know, these days wish I knew more of, but I've just picked up as much as I as I as I could. And I think it's also hard to just be an expert at every single topic, right? So you kind of have to make some some choices. And somehow I felt that my for my personality uh the the idea of going through physical sciences and kind of learning uh learning biology on top uh fitted fitted me uh better than uh, than the alternative way of doing it yeah. cool yeah totally agree kind of picking a field based on your personal experience you know parents in the medical field and maybe having interest there and then also uh you know you have to kind of do things you like and you shoot it for from a personal so, perspective so, 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 it kind of comes yeah. back to some of the points you made earlier that you you kind of have the broad direction you're going to watch but then when it comes to choosing your precise path within that, then it may make sense to optimize for, you know, what path works the best for you, where you have the best people supporting you. I think you shouldn't change the, you know, final goal that you want to go to watch just because of some external factors, because there needs to be an element of you as well in what you want to achieve. But like details, i.e., you know, through what course you're getting there or through, you know, what lab you're getting there, I think these already can easily come down to other uh, other aspects as well. You know? Cool. Okay. Now we set the stage for your career. I think that's probably more important than the work. I think it's kind of where you're coming from and what, what could drives you. So how did you choose to join Alpha Lee's lab? And maybe you can talk about the research you've done so far, or you did. Uh, we can talk about the pre, I, I mean, I think the preprint you put out um, around kind of like high third for structural biology was really interesting, but uh, you talk about, first question, how did you, why did you join Alpha Lee's lab of, of all, you know, of all groups? Yeah, I think that's uh, another uh, interesting story of just, you know, stars uh, nicely aligning for, for you. So after my, my w- w- when it came to watch the end of my PhD, I was applying for um, various different uh, fellowships, both in parallel, and I wrote my research proposal, what I want to work uh, work on, and send it to various different funding bodies, seeing who's, uh, who's interested in um, in funding it. And the fellowship I got uh, funding from was called the uh, Schmidt Science Fellows 
which is by mm -hmm. Eric Van der Schmidt uh, Family Family Foundation, essentially, and they very much believe in the in the idea of uh, interdisciplinary science and kind of bringing different fields together. Uh, I would say in a different way from most other funding bodies who are also emphasizing the importance of interdisciplinary science, but they're often doing it by saying that you know people in field A and field B should be writing a grant proposal together, right? And, you know, work on a problem together. They actually believe in kind of investing in, in individuals and giving them the chance to, to work at a few um, different fields and, you know, pivot after their PhD to different uh, different field. So I got a fellowship from that, uh, that organization. And I think the reason why I wanted to go, my PhD was kind of relatively experimental work. But then I was in, in lab, I was um, doing experiments on a variety of, uh, of different uh, questions. Some were related to kind of building high throughput uh, techniques for looking at proteins and protein aggregation and protein interactions, micro microfluidic techniques for, for this. And then I also, that was in Thomas Nose's lab, who I mentioned before, is a great, uh, great uh, mentor and advisor for, uh, for me. And then I also spent some time in Dave White's lab in, um, in Boston, where I was kind of working more on high throughput techniques at looking at uh, at single cells. And um, Dave's lab is one of the ones where everyone, like, you know, whatever uh, hour of the day you're, you're there, 2 a.m. or whatever, 8 a.m., there is always someone in the in the lab doing doing experiments. And uh, I was also there for just, you know, short, uh, short while, so I wanted to make the most of my my stay and when I was there at 1, 2 a.m. you know doing all these experiments I was saying to myself that if I'm producing all of this high throughput data on that particular project was actually on cyanobacteria and getting cyanobacteria to, to produce uh, electricity and build uh, photovoltaic cells out of this which was a very very interesting project but you know if you're if, if I'm there and producing all this data I better knew how to analyze this uh, this as well and I just you know felt like I have to educate myself more in the in the computational um, area so I had to find that for myself and I had got funding from uh, from Schmidt so everything was in a great uh, great situation that just started looking around the um, Cambridge uh, UK uh, ecosystem and uh, reached uh, reached out to actually a few uh, a few people because I knew I wanted to stay in the in the UK because of family reasons I, I couldn't move uh, move too far but yeah, across uh, across Cambridge talking to a variety of people and, uh, and and met with them and they somehow just liked Alpha and you know his his way of thinking, his way of approaching uh, problems, and he was very welcoming to watch me me as well, and said that yeah sure happily would uh, would have you in uh, in my group, and that's how we started working working together. Yeah, when my Schmidt Fellowship started. Cool. Okay. Great. I think that's kind of like you know kind of doing things that you're excited by, and then focusing on you know who you would like to be around. And so exactly. I think the same same story describes you. I had the broad direction that I knew I wanted to wanted to do, but then the details of how you're going there, you're choosing based on based on people. Yeah. Absolutely. It's okay. What was the kind of the project, or do you have a set of projects in the Lou Lab, or maybe one, and maybe you can talk about kind of the, the output so far. Mm, yeah. Uh, I think I, I took a relatively broad angle in the in the beginning. My interest, you know, when you're pivoting to new uh, new new field, you kind of want to get broad exposure to what what is going uh, going on. And actually, you know, one of the great things about like it's never easy to go to new new field. And one of the good things about the Schmidt Science Network was the fact that there were twenty of us doing that together. So you know, we would have a WhatsApp group where we would uh, uh, exchange messages about the pain <laughs> about you know learning. Did, learning did, about, you, did you have was pain was was pain great. Was Payne Greenside in your cohort, any chance? Or uh, she was a year above me, actually. Yeah. yeah oh, so you're above I, me. Okay. I interacted with uh, with her uh, her as well. She's a great uh, great person. I know her her startup company is doing really really well at the moment. So. Cool. Yeah, really. we're an investor. We're an investor in Big Hat. She's awesome. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I, are awesome. I have during my career also asked, asked for her advice for from from her especially when I was considering about you know spending more time working in an industrial environment she she was able to give me good good advice so uh, you 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 choose uh, you choose good companies to invest in Josh. yeah I know Mark and Payne got good taste of people Caddy you're 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 in the same league so okay so you have a broad set of projects in the lead lab and it had to yeah, do kind so, of, you know, I was that... looking at uh, molecular dynamics-based approaches for um, property prediction of small uh, small molecules, but uh, I think my kind of uh, heart probably was more in the direction of uh, of proteins and um, and biology to some degree uh, as well. So yeah, one of the key projects I ended up uh, working uh, working on was exactly how to uh, how to make use of you know experimental data. Where experimental data in, in our case was um, essentially crystal structures of uh, proteins and small molecules and the, the binding poses and how to make use of especially kind of, you know, relatively small amounts of data to uh, to solve this problem and like look at how small molecules are binding to proteins uh, the best. Because I think, you know, there are lots of approaches that are focusing on doing that purely 
in silica. And then there are also approaches that are kind of, you know, focusing on uh, specifically working with problems where you have a lot of data available. But to me, on, on some level, the, the interesting middle ground seems the one where there is just, you know, a little bit of data available to you. And how can you make use of this in the best way possible to essentially learn um, learn the most? And actually, um, it was a good, uh, you know, if you're working in a computational group, it's always uh, challenging to get access to um, interesting uh, data. And, you know, you almost need to convince experimentalists that they should do the experiments you think they should be doing instead of the ones they think they should be doing. And that's uh, that's really, really challenging, right? But um, at the time when I started working with Alpha was the same one when, um, well, actually that happened slightly later, but when the COVID uh, pandemic um, hit us. And uh, there was a, I don't know, again, if you've, you've heard of this or some of the listeners have, uh, have heard, but COVID Moonshot, they're very um, interesting uh, program that brought together a lot of scientists across the globe whose goal was essentially to develop a uh, open source antiviral against uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID focusing on the main protease uh, specifically. And uh, as part of this, there was actually the uh, Diamond Light Source uh, Center in Oxford that was generating a lot of interesting structural data, small molecule binding to, to proteins. And uh, Chanjadera's group um, uh, in New York were collaborating with uh, with a lot uh, as well. So I, I think there, there was, again, like, you know, a lot of interesting people uh, with different ideas working on the same, uh, same problem. And I think that's maybe, you know, how I ended up spending the most time working on exactly this problem rather than the MD work-related specific uh, problem where we were, you know, trying to break also very important properties like, say, solubility of small molecules and permeability of small molecules, which I think I still need to write the paper <laughs> paper up on, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, I got some of the work done. But I think it was literally, again, you know, the, the community effect and lots of other um, exciting people being, being around there thinking about this uh, this questions, how, how I ended up working mostly. Um, mostly on this and then in parallel uh, actually interestingly Thomas Knowles who was my as I mentioned before PhD advisor got in touch with me and said that you know some of the computational approaches we've been developing let's try to use these more for for proteins and specifically for liquid liquid phase separation as well so another kind of big part of my uh, fellowship work together with Alpha and Thomas was on exactly building a um, kind of predictive models for understanding how proteins are forming uh, condensates so I think yeah these were essentially the few um, the key, key contributions from my uh, Schmidt uh, Fellowship uh, work uh, using using structural data to predict uh, small molecule binding to to proteins and and then cool. predict protein uh, phase separation related behavior. Cool. Let's talk about the the first part using kind of high throughput crystallography to predict uh, new moments because that's kind of the in my opinion it's a beautiful work you did and, and so uh, you have this, uh, we'll put the link to the preprint where sure. um, you essentially use, I, I forgot how many structures, I think you'd use like a hundred protein ligand structures for a COVID, uh, COVID, COVID protease. And then you screen like 10,000 compounds. And from, maybe you can talk about that research, but from my understanding, the key breakthrough, and I look a little more about how you, how you figure out how to rank these molecules differently, because from me reading the paper a few times, the key, the key, the key trick for you to actually discover useful chemical compounds from a virtual screen based on, you know, 100 protein ligand structures is you, you, you compare the compounds pairwise first mm. and then did a bio, bioactivity ranking. Maybe mm. talk about the research, but how did you, what, what was the kind of, that seems to be the big breakthrough or the big kind of the intellectual leap you had to make or intellectual like creativity. How did you get there? I'm most fascinated with that. Mm. Uh, I, I I would definitely want to credit um, Alpha here uh, here a lot. I think he was the he was the person who first uh, suggested that let's uh, let's do it pair uh, pairwise. But like conceptually, I feel there is there is a lot of beauty to to this idea. So if if you're thinking about machine learning models, people are often building classifier models. But then you know all all that is telling you is essentially if or what what class something belongs to. Uh, and if you want to find a compound that would be more potent than another compound, it's almost like, you know, if they're in the same class, it's very hard to say if or not it will uh, fulfill that, uh, that constraint, right? And then that's where there is attraction to watch building regressor models, uh, where you're actually predicting the precise value. But with such models, it's just so hard not to end up learning learning noise because, you know, any measurement system, you know, and that's the experimentalist in me, me speaking, has uh, has some level of noise to this. And often it's really hard to even determine what the level of noise uh, noise is. But we kind of had a look at this experimental data and where we're asking ourselves that where do we feel noise essentially 
begins or no it start uh, finishes and signal signal begins and kind of define some uh, some threshold and then we were asking the questions that are two compounds more different from each other than that threshold and that kind of feels almost like a marriage between the two two approaches that is a uh, regressor based approach and the classifier based uh, based approach you're still building a classifier model and you're not learning the noise but you're actually getting rankings and um yeah, and I think you know the other other beautiful aspect of this was like when we when we, we used um, we used available data from uh, Diamond uh, Light Source and um, and we're, we're we're using this essentially to train the train the model before starting to do the in silico screen, but then you have more than one compound that you know is potent. So when you're doing things in silico screen, you can actually rank these ten thousand compounds relative to all of the top ones, and you can only focus on these which come out as the top ones according to or like you know when compared to every every single hit so i feel that's kind of another really good way of producing because often the outcome of insilica screens is they have so many things that are potentially interesting but that is really helping you to re reduce that down and in a somewhat orthogonal way in the sense that oftentimes the hits are coming from different scaffolds right so you're not kind yep. of firing just to watch one uh, one scaffold if your key leading compounds are from different um yep. series so, yeah. I think this research in the context of like docking and just virtual screen elsewhere, like most virtual screens of small molecules for like a given protein target generate a lot of low quality hits mm -hmm. that, don't, uh, that don't match experimental data. Mm -hmm. And then you like, you discover some molecule thing is really potent and then you actually put it in an animal and you spend all this money and you're like, oh, it's useless. Um, and so you have to go and you, know, you keep on, you put, you, you put garbage in, garbage out. And so mm -hmm. kind of your, your research is kind of, uh, a better kind of virtual screening method that actually can match experimental data. And so when you think about this research, this ability to combine high throughput crystallography with like machine learning to then produce um, better virtual discovered small molecules, what's the kind of the bottleneck there? Is it is it the modeling? Is it the actual data generation? And, you know, kind of what do you see the next steps for the type of research? Yeah, great, uh, great questions, and I mean, I'm I'm very much looking in the in the direction of the of the key uh, key companies in uh, in this area at the moment, like you know, Isomorphic, uh, Charm, all the all the other key companies have been formed in in this context to see how how they will push the boundaries, because probably whatever I will I will say is the boundary they've already solved uh, internally, right? But uh, but I mean I, I personally and again it's probably because I'm I'm trained as a, as an experimentalist during uh, during my PhD but I almost feel that there is limited value in not using experimental data to to see the models if you if you can because you know sure conceptually it's really beautiful that we can do things in uh, in silica if you're thinking about the you know full drug discovery pipeline then then you know there it's it's long and and you know sometimes even synthesizing the the protein sure it requires some resource and it can you know, require a few these days oftentimes in a few months worth of work but if the full pipeline is like you know 10 10 years long it's actually not that a big that big problem to spend some time on on uh, on synthesizing this right and, uh, and actually getting as uh, uh, as much information out of real data uh, as uh, as possible so i think that uh, but you know you do you don't want to spend infinite resource on uh, on this. So exactly, you know, screening a small number of molecules against this and making sure that you're integrating as effectively these learnings as uh, as possible. And you know, probably screening for for a few different types of uh, of proteins. But then you also have cases where proteins are not even folded, and you don't have the same finding pockets available. And that's actually one of uh, one of the current um, questions I'm um, I'm focusing on uh, on a lot uh, when I'm working as, as part of uh, transition that, you know, what do we do if we have uh, not not structured uh, proteins and how do we still do anything useful in uh, in that context, right? But, uh, but yeah, coming coming back to your um, previous questions, I mean, I think there is a lot can, that can be done on the on the computational side. But I, I mean, I, I personally think that just bring in some experimental capabilities, even if that's not your primary primary focus is as soon as possible, and if that's accessible to you, why why not make make use of this? Totally well, great. When I read your preprint, I was like, wow, this is such a break, this is an intellectual breakthrough for me. Where the value of a diverse set of protein ligand structures and where mm -hmm. that can actually help build better models. Uh, I think I think there's a lot of work left to be done there. And so maybe we can make yeah, that. We're taking this uh, this work uh, kind of forward in the in the sense that uh, already we're, uh, for instance, in this in the context of the same data, we're looking into how to how to generate even less <laughs> less data or screen even fewer compounds. So uh, you know which 
given the 200 structures we had available for uh, for us you know how, how how would we come up with a protocol that if we were only to screen 50 how would we still get the good performance because like uh, i don't know how detailed they looked at the at the paper but we're essentially comparing what happens as a result of the number of compounds in the in the training data kind of below 100 we don't really get a good performance but uh but you know that really illustrates to you that it's probably not the absolute number but the way how these compounds are are chosen mm -hmm. so that's kind of you know one of the ongoing uh directions and then actually also, um, interestingly, the people who were kind of part of the COVID Moonshot, Moonshot uh, Consortium recently got a bigger grant from NIH to kind of, you know, use the same framework in the context of other uh, viral uh, diseases um, as well. And I think we are going to have the, uh, similar data against different uh, systems as well so that we can really validate if the learnings were kind of specific to just this case or are they more, uh, more generalizable. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's something I'm actually quite uh, quite excited about getting getting more data through uh, through that initiative. Mm. Cool. And then let's get to the penultimate part, the fancy word. Uh, okay. So your your transition, but maybe talk about your time to research. And right now you're are you the, are you the head of machine learning or are you the head of something at Transition Bio? Um, you know, how did you you know you bring some of the work you've done, maybe in the virtual screening part, and now you're kind of using it in Condensate. Um, how did you get interested in Condensate? You know, um, you know, what are you doing at transition right now? Um, what are you excited about uh, in terms of what are the new, what are the problems you're trying to wrestle with right now to bring, let's say, machine learning and chemistry to compensate biology, which is really exciting and, and new. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, very many, very, very good and valid, uh, valid questions. I think the the reason why I'm uh, why I'm excited about uh, condensates is just because how you know very very simple concept of uh, or, or simple idea of, of condensates are actually playing such a broad role across biology like you know people are seeing condensates and we can have a separate discussion if or not you know how how liquid a condensate needs to be or can it have some you know gel elements to this as well or, or you know when 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 does an aggregate start and when when, when it's still a liquid liquid condensate and when when it's a gel but uh, you know in principle this, this concept is kind of relevant across you know so many different domains from stress responses to uh, gene regulation to signaling and then many many other uh, functionalities and I think it's also kind of um you know, taking uh, again, if you're looking at drug uh, drug discovery uh, and uh, and development, uh, oftentimes things fail because of uh, of biology, uh, not because of us being unable to find a small molecule that would be very good, um, that would bind very well, very well, right? But because it's just you know not acting on on target or or the target modifying the target not having the effect where we think that it does. But that's like condensates are kind of on some level taking a step. Further, your target is no longer one protein, but it's kind of a a system, a complex system that is playing broader role. And uh, and you know, even your screening can't happen against just a single component, but it kind of has has to happen on a broader uh, broader scale. So I think the the reason why I got the person before, um, into this idea, and I know it's a very very controversial uh, field, although I think that the controversiality is a lot associated with uh, with the terminology and you know how you're trying to resell an old uh, old concept and so on. And I'm not you know arguing that in any uh, any way. I think the the interesting question is can we can we use this to treat uh, treat diseases? And I feel on some level it's kind of a step towards the right uh, right direction because you're actually you know, looking at a system as your uh, target rather than just a single um, single protein. Uh, but anyway, that's why I like uh, like condensates, and um, and I think I the reason why I yeah I'm why I'm very involved with the transition now is um, is uh, is because to to do this work well you you need a lot of resource and you need a lot of data, and it's uh, we were we we're talking about COVID moonshot uh, before as a good uh, good way to uh, you know good initiative that was creating a lot of uh, data. And I was mentioning some of my earlier projects that I wasn't as, as excited about in, in a computational chemistry context, which I think was partly because I was like, yes, I built this great model and what now? Like what next? I kind of you know wanted to see the, the goal as well. And and that's why you know you just working in your own corner building building a model. I felt that that wasn't uh, wasn't for me, but I kind of you know wanted to be wanted this to help the bigger 
ecosystem. And uh, and yeah, I think that's why I felt with the condensate work uh, work as well. That there is uh, just limited amount of uh, data that is available. Creating data is often expensive, especially at the at the scale where you can actually learn something as uh, complex as uh, as biology. And through through um, activities of transition, I think that's that's the best way how we can uh, move uh, make make progress in that direction. Cool. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what you publish and do. And I think transition is very lucky to have you. Uh, so uh, very lucky to have you. And so yeah, I think condensates are very interesting biology. And I think, yeah, like you said, if you generate enough data, you'd be able to figure out wh which diseases they're influencing, because they are. And then also trying to figure out, you know, where they actually exist and at what time. And, um, you know, kind of condensates at a high level is where biology meets, phys meets physics. I think that's what, one reason why you're really interested in it because like you kind of have to actually generate all this data and there's actually physical components to these communities and kind of you know yeah it, it kind of, that's a whole another hour conversation on the history of condensates because it's it's a fascinating i, I come from a c elegant background initially mm. ah yeah so okay. con familiar. condensates you kind of these granular they were discovered in these worms and so uh i'm kind of i've been i, I come from that angle where i can know the history of the field and only kind of now do we have more powerful enough tools to image uh, mm -hmm. these condensates and then you know, probe them. And so I think it's the next decade of the field is going to be really, yeah. I mean, really I, new. I, I, I feel it's a good good excuse in some level to learn uh, learn biology, right? You know, you're focusing on <laughs> you're actually learning about the broader biology around everything as well, because you, you just can't treat it in iso isolation. It's just so associated with that. Uh, with everything like you know it's sometimes really hard to say if condensates are there in the beginning or if they're formed as a result of you know some other pathway interacting with that uh, with others so yeah i sometimes say it's, it's an excuse to learn biology oh interesting okay that's a good point okay that's pretty good okay yeah you can condensate or a way for you to learn biology i like it uh okay maybe to get to wrap it up to the end of it, uh, you've had this incredible career uh you know from a freaking awesome arithmetic machine to tennis player to then really freaking incredible world-class chemist and now you're doing condensates. What do you see the next five, ten years of your career? Do you want to, you know, what, what kind of what are your big goals? Is it you, do you want to make, do you want to be part of a, a drug approval? Do you want to start a company? Do you want to, what kind of, what kind of, what, 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 what do you kind of, what, what do you see the big things you're pursuing? What, what directions do you want to go into? Mm -hmm. and, what, and, what, and what excites you too? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I think my, my near term future will be uh, quite uh, quite focused exactly on uh, biotech and drug uh, drug development and kind of you know curing um, contributing towards uh, towards human human health and our understanding of human health and uh, and disease and I you know I'm actually very happy that I'm involved with the uh, transition at the moment because I'm actually closer to having an impact than I would ever ever do if it were if I was uh, purely just in an academic um, academic context so I feel that's uh, that's exactly the right um, Right thing for me to to focus on uh, at the moment, as well as you know all the activities that are uh, are uh, hopefully building on the on the COVID moonshot work that we were doing uh, doing before, and as I mentioned, looking in the context of other viral viral diseases, what's uh, what's going on. So I think these are the near term questions that are uh, are interesting uh, me, and uh, and I want to do it exactly together with the with the people who are similarly excited about this uh, these questions as uh, as I am, and I just feel really really privileged to have such people uh, people around me. Uh, but then, you know, when I'm <laughs> looking uh, outside at the heat wave that is here and that I don't remember uh, being as crazy when when I was still growing growing up and, and looking at the three, three young kids I have uh, I have at home and what planet I'm leaving, leaving behind for, uh, for them, I feel like, you know, right right now I'm kind of relatively focused on what's going on and I don't want to leave it, uh, leave it. but if I, for some reason, things weren't going as well as they, as they were and I, or, you know, at some stage in future I, I want to move on, then I'm quite... Quite certain that I want the focus to be on probably still with the biotech hat uh, hat on to to some degree, but uh, on uh, on maybe even even bigger bigger problems like uh, like climate and our environment uh, and uh, even agriculture to to some degree. I, I don't want to kind of you know pin down one uh, one specific uh, problem, but yeah, you know maybe I don't know if I listen to this in ten years from from now, maybe. Cool. Some I didn't know that. It's some, I learned something new today. But yeah, I think transition is doing really incredible work, and so. You know, it's a really great place yeah, to be, and then very long, long term, right? So, uh, and who, who yeah. knows? Maybe, maybe there will be just too too much interesting things to solve in where where I am at the moment. I will never never make this move, but you know, just honestly looking at what's happening around around us, uh, you know, I think. Uh, 
one thing is that I'm working on uh, my myself, but uh, but you know, in terms of uh, encouraging uh, other other people, I think that that's an area where, where a lot uh, could be done and uh, and should be done. And if you can get more more uh, human resource best best resource on the planet to think about this uh, these questions, then you know that's uh, that's that's the best outcome of this uh, conversation with uh, with you at the moment. If any any talented person listening yeah. to this uh, is uh, is getting more and more excited about looking at these questions. Yeah. Cool. Okay. That's exciting. I think, uh, I think a lot of people are going to find this useful, not only right now, but like over the next course of the next decade. And so, uh, and we'll do like a, a version two in a few years and then we'll do updates. We'll do updates, Caddy. And then, uh, you know, we'll kind of do a whole little like a, uh, a uh, 40 decade, uh, we'll make a whole documentary one day, like 40, de four decades from now, we'll have a whole documentary, <laughs> a little covers, a, little, a, little, a canvas of conversations <laughs> and, and see, see your career. And I, I, I know for a fact you're, you're going to do incredible work. So like, I know, that's what I wanted to talk to you right now. Okay. And uh, you should uh, have a panel and focus on those who are either the most consistent in terms of what they're saying or they I only like talking to superstars. It's just how I spend my time. Uh, and so uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me right now. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, yeah. I really appreciate uh, it. Thanks, thanks again for, for inviting me. And uh, even more importantly, for, for doing this. I think that's uh, really, really great that you're actually you know, thinking about um, about the younger uh, younger generation who's, who's finding it really, really hard to make uh, make choices between things and and i know that's you know in your mind one of the primary audiences for uh, for this so i think it's really really valuable mm -hmm. that you this question this is going to serve as a resource for up and coming scientists engineers to make great decisions and you know i think your career is a, a kind of an example one to kind of be inspired by at least in my opinion and so and i think there's you know all you need all, to be honest as long as this reaches one person that's cool it's good enough for me as long as like one really talented person gets something out of it that's like cool and they as long as they email me and i can invest in their company mm -hmm. boom totally worth it uh and I, you know and have a lot of totally worth it for me and if, if, if other people get something out of it that's cool too um mm -hmm. but caddy i really appreciate it. i know it's really hot so try to uh, get eat hydrated but uh i really yeah. appreciate taking time here yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot for your uh, your time as well. And I'll also also say the fact that make make sure that you do a good uh, hundred hundred of such podcasts because I always feel that it's very dangerous to follow one one person's story. But you know, if there are hundred you hear, then you just pick out uh, an element from from each of them that works works for you. Because I think every every person is different. And has totally agree. So keep 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 up the hard work, Josh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.